I'm, I'm, gonna t I'm not talking about Chekhov. I'm talking about one Chekhov story, which is called Gusev, which is a really important story to me. Um, and uh, the piece I'm going to read out was published in the New Statesman. And in the comments underneath, it's, it's partly about my granddad. All my cousins, and, and cousins, including cousins that I've never met, like from South Africa and Australia, started to put little extra notes in. So as I read this out, I've got more information now from my cousins, and this will, this will interfere with the reading. I was really interested in what Ra said at the beginning about the kind of the morphology and the geography of stories, which, as a film writer, is this kind of hideous demon that leans over you because it, when you're writing a film script, there's this algorithm, there's this grid that it's all got to fit in. If you use Final Draft, which is the kind of industry standard screenwriting thing, you can actually click on the help button and it will say to you, you're on page 52, you should be midway through the second act by now. You need a slight... slight and what appeals to me, therefore, about Chekhov is that appearance, anyway, of improvisation and unpredictability and that feeling that you feel that Chekhov doesn't know where this story's going either. And at the same time that you're in the hands of someone who's completely in control, but because he's in that control, he's able to surf what's going on. And that's what appeals to me about him. Um, can I is it all right to close this? Or? Is it all right? Yeah. Um, OK. So my granddad was born with a call. Does everyone know what that is? Right. It, in those days, there was a, a superstition among sailors that anyone born with a call could never drown. A call is like the papery um, remains of the amniotic sac. So you're born with this little kind of paper bonnet on your head. Um, and I never met my granddad. But I'm guessing that if you were, as he was, a sailor in the war, it was comforting to believe that you weren't going to drown. When he was first married, he jumped ship. He ran home um, instead of embarking, and he got married, right? And I now know that he, um, he was on a ship called the Hampshire, which had been involved in the Battle of Jutland, which is this colossal naval catastrophe it, with an incredibly heavy loss of life. And the ship then was going to go to Archangel, carrying uh, Lord Kitchener on a diplomatic mission. And if you look at the dates, it's a really tight turnaround. So somehow he got from Scarpa Flow to Liverpool, got married, and in the course of that got bladdered um, and missed the boat. And, and kind of can't quite figure out the timing of it, but supposedly he was arrested at his wedding for desert, because this was wartime. So not getting back in time was desertion. So someone must have sort of sent a telegram, but he was arrested by two coppers who frog marched him to the bridewell where he spent the next few days. And while he was in the Bridewell in those few days, the Hampshire set sail um, from Scarpa Flow, just off Orkney, it hit heavy seas, hit a mine, and was lost with all hands. Seven guys survived. 700 people on the boat, seven survived. Lord Kitchener died. My granddad didn't die because he was bladdered in the Bridewell. Um, uh, which is, you know, that, he had this extraordinary piece of luck and I've, since then, a friend of mine, Rosie Dawson, who's a radio producer, uh, has ha sort of looked into this. This is not just my cousin, you see. None of this is on here. Um, not just my cousin. And found a newspaper report of the loss. And the two st my granddad was a stoker. Uh, so his job was to keep the furnace going. And uh, the newspaper report in the Liverpool Courier of the loss of the Hampshire carries a photograph of two lads in, in their early 20s who were lost, and they, they, they were the local lads who were lost in the wreck. And they were both stokers. One was from Great Cross Hall Street, one was from Stanley Road. They were both, therefore, from within about 200 yards of this bridewell and, and, and of my granddad's house. So we would definitely have known them. And it's a quite an eerie feeling to look at this photograph and think, well, these are the guys who died when my granddad didn't die. Um, so I'll go back to reading this now. So he, he had this amazingly lucky escape and this was in the First World War, got through the whole of the First World War, got through the whole of the Second World War without a scratch. And I keep thinking, well, he must have thought, this call is keeping me lucky. This is what's stopping me from drowning. Then in 1949, he was working, um, he'd, he'd sort of gone back to sea. He'd been a petty officer in the war, but he sort of then kind of came back to land, but took these sort of little inland jobs. And he was on a ship called the Sidonia, which was coming into Cardiff Bay in 1949, hit a mine, uh, the boiler blew, and he was the only loss. Everyone else was fine, but the only person killed was my granddad. 
Um, and he wasn't drowned because he was the stoker and his job was to keep the furnace going. So, and the stoke, the engine, the thing blew up. So he was actually, he was boiled alive. He never did drown. And going back to Ra's point at the beginning about the mechanics, you can completely see what kind of story Guy de Maupassant would have made of that, which would be, you know, ha, ha, ha. He thought he wasn't going to drown, and guess what? He didn't. He, he was boiled alive instead. What an idiot. You know? And that would have been the Baudelaire story. Now, I lived with my grandma when I was a little boy in a flat on Stanley Road, and she, I lived there. It was a tiny flat. My brother and I and my mum and dad slept in one bedroom, and my grandma slept in the other bedroom. And she, she liked quietness. She never put the telly on, she never put the radio on. If my mum and dad were busy, I would sit in the room with her, the big room with her, which was full of statues of saints. And also, inexplicably, clocks, like a lot of clocks. And, so, and this was like, I can just remember this like endless ticking, as though you could feel the seconds of your lifespan being plucked out of you, like being depilated by death itself. And it was just really, really boring. She never talked. Um, and she never went anywhere, she never left the little kind of matrix of streets that was her parish, except when we finally moved out on Christmas Day, she would come and see us. But in the corner of the room was this cabinet, which was full of these amazing things that my granddad had brought back from his travels in the, in the, South, in the China, South China Seas and you know, across the Baltic and everything like that. I had a list of them here. What was it? There was um, a pale tea service so delicate it seemed to tremble like a sea creature behind the glass a chunk of coral, a shell with Psalm 107 burnt into it, and a varnished porcupine fish. And that's all I knew about my granddad. There was a photograph of him and these belongings. She never talked about him. My dad didn't really know him, so he never talked about him. So my, my granddad wasn't like on my radar at all until I heard this story, which my grandma very uncharacteristically just came out with one Christmas day. And she never spoke at any length. Christmas day, she would normally come around to ours, watch the telly, not off during Morecambe and Wise. Say this thing, like, uh, she must have been, a, the, the clocks thing was probably in her head. She would say, at the end of the Christmas dinner, she would say, it's as far away as ever now. Because she was like, what you want to hear on Christmas Day when you're a kid? Thank you. <laughs> you know. Um, the, her other great sentence was, this winter will see me off. <laughs> which, which, if I do the maths now, she was about 52 when she was saying this. Um, and then she suddenly came out with this story on Christmas Day, and we were all in the room, and I, I kind of, it was so uncharacteristic, and she suddenly told this stuff about the call, which my dad didn't know, and this lucky escape. And I kind of think, well, she must have been sitting there watching Morecambe and Wise, with these, like, just beginning to be quite punky teenage grandsons, and the g plan furniture, and the, the shag pile carpet, and must have thought, like, she must have had a kind of David Byrne, how did I get here moment. And she just suddenly popped out with this story, which was like, and nobody in this room and nothing in this room would have been here if my granddad hadn't got bladdered this day. Very uncharacteristically, he became a petty officer in the war. He was really not that kind of person, but he got bladdered, and that's why I'm here. You know, that's why I'm here today, and that's why all my cousins in South Africa and Australia are here, anyway. But I'll get back to the text now. Okay, so one day, I was, at, I was at a Toronto Film Festival at the height of my glamour, right? Um, which isn't great if you're a screenwriter. And, um, but, you know, incredibly glam for me, an incredibly glamorous thing. And we were at the press call. And the press call, if you're a f screenwriter, is that there's, like, there's a room and journalists come in and out. And the director and the star are over there. So, like, Vogue is going to the star and Sight and Sound or Empire is going to the director. And... Mexican truck magazine or something like that is coming to the screenwriter you know, for the filler paragraph or whatever. And it's really, obviously really rude to read between these interviews. I didn't want to get a book out. But I had my phone and I noodled around on my phone and I, got, I found Gusev, which is this story by Chekhov. And that was the first time I'd ever read it. And technologically, sociologically, geographically, emotionally, I was in a completely different solar system from my grandma's flat. But one paragraph... In one paragraph in, for the first time, first time ever in my whole life, my granddad entered my imagination. Everything about the story led me to think about my granddad. So Gusev is an orderly heading home to Russia in the sick bay of a tramp steamer. He's talkative, he's feverish, he annoys the other 
passengers. In particular, one of the other passengers is a bit of an intellectual called Pavel Ivanovich. And he keeps worrying that the ship is going to be broken on the back of a big fish or that the wind will break its chains. And as he slips in and out of consciousness, he has these visions of home. And heartbreakingly, these visions always f feature a pond, which is like a domestic, manageable version of the sea. And eventually he dies, and his body's sewn up in sa sailcloth, and it's tipped over the side. And it splashes into the sea, and its foam makes it look as though it's wrapped in lace, this amazing image. And he disappears into the waves. And then Chekhov produces this astonishing ending. He, f he follows Gusev's corpse down to the bottom of the sea, through the, through the food chain, past these startled pilot fish and a curious shark. And it's just like the last place you're expecting this story to go. It's this amazing, it's like the ending of the dead. It's this big musical poem that comes out at the end of this story. And part of the reason I had such a strong reaction of course, is that my granddad is the only riv relative that I've got who is probably rolling around at the bottom of the sea. Um, there's also the fact that Gusev is returning from a war and that he's dreaming of home, that he didn't belong out there on the sea. And on top of all that, though, Gusev just does seem like a real person. And this seems, and this seems like a real incident. And this happens a lot when you're reading Chekhov, that you've got the feeling that you're reading about something that you have that overwhelming feeling that you're reading about something that really happened. And one of my kind of big things as a writer is, how does, how does he do that? How does he pull that off? And partly, of course, it's because often enough it is. Um, Chekhov was out and about in the world with his eyes open. In 1890, he spent three months trekking across Siberia to get to the penal colony at Sakhalin. And on the way, he wrote these amazing, everyone should read these, these incredible letters to his sister. Um, and he came back on a steamer, and there were two passengers on board in one of these letters, and one of whom was extremely ill. And the character of Gusev has this kind of weird oddity that you feel can only come from observation. It's not like an invented character. Uh, Gusev, he's really unlikable. He's, he's there in the middle of the story. He's dying, so you should feel sympathy with him. But he's also incredibly annoying. Uh, he hates Chinese people. And he tells this big anecdote about how some Chinese people came into the courtyard, and he thumped them. And Ivanovich says to him, why did you do that? And he says, I just hate Chinese people. Um, um, oh, nothing. I, I hate them because they came into the yard. And when he's dead and trussed up in this sailcloth, Chekhov describes him with this incredibly undignified uh, image. He says he looks like a carrot or a radish, broad at the top and narrow at the bottom. And of course he does. And of course that's exactly what he would look like. And what could be more real than that? Chekhov was a doctor. And it, it's a, a really serious matter when a doctor lets somebody die, even in a story, even a fictional character. For a doctor to let you die, that seems like a big thing. And the landscape is also drawn from observation. If you read these letters, in another of the Siberian letters, he describes crossing Lake Baikal. If you don't read anything, you should read this letter. It's an amazing letter. It takes him days to find a way to get across the lake. And uh, he gets on the boat and he looks down, and the water is incredibly clear. It's like it's not there. And he can see to incredible depth. And the first time I read it, I had this sort of shock of delight of, oh, that's where he got that ending of Gusev from. You could see where he got it from. The extraordinary thing about any Chekhov story is that when you begin to read one, you have no idea where it's going to end up. You can easily imagine the story that, I've already said this, that Demopa would have made, the Macbethy irony of him being bored alive. I've already made snide comments about Demopa so I will skip that bit. Um, but for me, the most arresting thing about his life was how utterly unpredictable of my granddad's life, sorry, about my granddad's life was how utterly unpredictable its consequences were. If he hadn't jumped ship that night and been prepared to be locked up for an extra night with his wife, I wouldn't be here writing, I wouldn't exist. No of my children, my siblings, my cousins, dozens of people are only alive because of this tipsy win. Gusev is unpredictable in the way that life is. It starts with a kind of comedy routine between the ignorant Gusev and the much superior Pavel Ivanovich, but it ends up with this soaring, sacramental prose poem. Writers who try to imitate Chekhov sometimes mistake this unpredictability for randomness, or a trudging realism, or worse, honesty, the worst thing of all. But Chekhov isn't a journalist or a memoirist. He began as a hack. He wrote skits and sketches. Oh, with what trash I began, he wrote in one of the letters. He could write anywhere, 
which is a hack's gift. He can write on a tramp steamer coming back from Sakhalin. He can write about anything. For instance, a garrulous dying passenger. These are the things that being a hack teaches you. He also has a hack's massive repertoire of tricks. I've just put ink in my eye. Um, he's also got hacks, massive repertoire of tricks and techniques. His unpredictability doesn't come from rejecting artifice and contrivance. It comes from being an absolute master of artifice and contrivance. If you go back through the story, you can see that utterly unexpected hairs on the back of your neck ending is beautifully set up. In Gusev's silly nonsense about the wind and the chains and the giant fish, in the remembered pond, the sea is always threatening to overwhelm the story. This is true tonally, too. Gusev and Pavel are both convincing individual characters. They're brilliantly observed. But as they bicker, as the story goes on, they move further and further apart until each comes to sort of stand for a different view of life. Without you really noticing, a sort of platonic dialogue emerges, which gathers in urgency as Gusev sails towards his own death. Line by line, the comedy routine becomes a philosophical debate. There's a mimetic shift. Does life mean anything? Does Gusev mean anything? Pavel Ivanovich dismisses Gusev's chances of ever grasping the point of his own life. Foolish, pitiful man, he says. You don't understand anything. Yet Gusev reaches out for understanding. This is a quote from the story. A vague urge disturbs him. He drinks some water, but that isn't it. He stretches towards the porthole and breathes in the hot, dank air. But it's not that either. He tries to think of home and frost, but it still isn't right. Chekhov's great tenderness is that his story seems to be reaching out for a shape and an ending at the same time as Gusev himself is trying to reach out through his fever for some kind of meaning. They're in this together. Gusev can't pin down a meaning for himself, but he has a sense that there is a meaning out there somewhere in the complexity of time and tide. Maybe it will all make sense, maybe it will all make sense to my granddad if he come, come here tonight and see what he began the night he jumped ship. Then there's this ending. In one sense, it shows us Gusev as nothing but a piece of meat, dumped over the side, sinking to the bottom. Chekhov once said that his holy of holies was the human body, and the end of this story brutally converts Gusev into a physical object, a chunk of protein in the food chain, a piece of meat. But we're also overwhelmed by the sense of grandeur and beauty, and what an amazing thing a protein is, or a food chain is. What a magnificent thing meat is. It's impossible to read that section without being pulled up short by how fragile and ridiculous we are. We're like carrots or radishes. But also, how amazingly beautiful, wrapped in lace. It describes life reduced to its components and recalls, inevitably, Psalm 107, the psalm that was inscribed on my granddad's shell. They, go down, they that go down to the sea in ships that do their business on great waters. They see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. Okay.